The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hey team, Ben Nash here. I'm one of the co-founders at XY Advisor and founder of the rapidly growing Pivot Wealth, which is my business baby. I started from scratch about eight years ago and I've since scaled up to become one of Australia's better known financial advice companies for high income accumulators. You can join me every Tuesday as I have the pleasure of furthering my own knowledge by interviewing some of the best people in our industry and beyond to improve every part of what we do with our advice process. We're currently hiring financial advisors and associates, so if our approach resonates, you can learn more at pivotwealth.com.au forward slash careers. Perpetual is a dynamic, active manager offering an extensive range of specialist investment capabilities, including Australian and global equities, credit, fixed income, multi-asset, as well as environmental, social and governance, designed to help meet the needs of clients across Australia and New Zealand. Underpinned by our long-standing and market-leading Australian equities capability, Perpetual also offers an extensive contemporary range of funds. As one of Australia's longest-serving and most trusted investment managers, our long-standing commitment is to deliver superior outcomes over the long term to clients. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor team, and today I'm here with Ryan Porter. Ryan is a founder and director at Catalyst Wealth, um, and uh, he actually also owns a semi-professional zoo um, that happens at his house each evening from uh, from five to eight. He's, he tells me with uh, three kids under five. So we we might get into some life advice, but uh, I'm keen to to pick Ryan's brain on uh, his advice journey and some of the things that he's focused on today. Ryan, thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks for having me, Ben. Mate, uh, you've been at it for about six years, uh, running as your own business, but in advice for a bit longer than that. I thought maybe a good place to start was maybe just talk us through your your advice journey and how you've ended up where you are today. Yeah, sure. No worries. Uh, came into the industry in 2009, um, around sort of, you know, mid-ish GFC. Um, so getting a, a job was a little bit tricky. I was a I was a high school PE teacher in another life, doing the casual teaching circuit, not really enjoying what I was doing. Um, and I had a mate who was a professional footy player who got injured and um, was doing his DFP with AMP in the Horizons Academy. And so he sort of we used to catch up all the time and sort of talk about property investing, share investing, and he just said you should have a look at this. Um, you know, you're not real happy in teaching. So um, yeah, sort of jumped in and um, through Kaplan did the DFP. Started the financial planning journey, went out looking for a job and everywhere um, wanted you to have two years experience. So um, struggled, struggled with things for a while and uh, ended up getting a job at uh, like a mortgage broking company. One of the directors was a planner uh, and they were sort of looking to switch on a financial planning business um, pretty quickly. But when I started, they said, look, we're not ready just yet. So we'll throw you in, we'll get you to your mortgage broking um, sort of accreditation. So you've got both. Um, and then, yeah, they switched on the financial planning business about six months in once I finished the course and just said, all right, jump out, uh, go, on, go, on, go and do some insurance. So um, started in the, in the, in the business, um, yeah, in a mortgage broking slash planning business, focusing sort of on, on that insurance piece. And, uh, yeah, from, from there, um, had a couple of jobs and then, yeah, um, became an owner in an MLC franchise, uh, MLC Advice in Caring Bar 2016. A couple of years later, jumped out of the franchise and sort of rebranded and created Catalyst Wealth Group. Um, so, yeah, so long-winded response, but uh, 2009 through to sort of 22 and, yeah, maybe four or five advice stops in between. Yeah, nice. And um, what led you to start your own business and how did you find that transition after being in the game for a little while? Well, we, we, with the same friend um, who sort of got me into the industry, he he actually owned the franchise prior to me taking it over, and we, we would sort of catch up all the time and I guess talk about as an industry, it, it was an awesome industry where you could do good work, but from a business owner perspective, it was an opportunity to um, 
you know, create your own business or start your own business and build an asset while sort of doing work that you enjoyed. So it was probably that, um, yeah, big, big picture planning around doing good work day to day, helping clients, but at the same time being able to build an asset that could sort of help financially in the future sort of triggered me. Um, it, in my family, there's sort of four small businesses. So I like come from, yeah, parents and grandparents who have all, all, all owned their small businesses. So I was sort of in my blood and, yeah, one of my sort of big goals, I guess, just from watching all them um, o- over time and go on their sort of individual journeys was to sort of, yeah, eventually become a business owner in some sort of capacity and advice was where I ended up. Nice. And and what surprised you the most about that transition going from being an advisor inside a business to, uh, you know, running the show yourself? Yeah, well, that um, it's it's still um, it's still a challenge to this day. I would say, sort of been five six years in on on the business front, but just the um, the difference between being an advisor, walking in and sort of doing what you need to do in front of the clients. And then outside of that, all the business responsibilities that come with running your own show and managing a team and um, all the business administration that needs to be done whilst being an advisor, um, which is, yeah, as I said, still a bit of a work in progress after a couple of years. Well, mate, if you figure it out, just uh, just let me know because I still struggle with uh, all of those things, you know, what to focus on, the, you know, the million things that you can do that it seem like sort of good decisions, but what's the best decision and how to grow and how to build your team and how to tweak your service. And uh, there's always plenty to, to work on. And I think one of the things for me that attracted me to advice when I was early on in the piece was the fact that there's so much like legislation to learn and tax rules and strategies and then that changes all the time as well with what's going on you know with the with the law with the um the regulatory framework and with what's going on in markets as well so and i think that business owner is like the next level to that where you've got all of that stuff but then you've got all of the business piece um that sits around it as well just for the people listening in, what, what does your team look like and what do your what do your clients look like and what do you do for them? So at the moment, there's three of us in the team. Uh, I'm the only advisor. Um, Aaron, who works for me, he's sort of the power planner and I guess like sort of strategy advisor. And then we've got Jazzy, who's uh, in the Philippines, who sort of does most of the admin uh, work, admin support. From a client perspective, um, most clients would be sort of 30s, 40s and 50s. Um, usually predominantly couples, um, probably higher income earning corporates. We're, we're based in the Sutherland Shire. So uh, in where we live, I guess property uh, is, is sort of a big um, focal point. So most clients have got sort of reason for big mortgages if they've sort of got assets. And, um, yeah, focus would normally be, you know, setting them up for retirement or, or going on sort of usually like a 10-year financial planning journey where we're sort of helping them work towards their goals and um, create wealth along the path. Nice. And I was going to, um, I just had a bit of a blank because I was trying to think of a joke about Southern Cross tattoos and whether people might get a discount if um, uh, <laughs> if they have, because I've heard that the Sutherland Shire has the highest per capita number of Southern Cross tattoos. Is that true? I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and in the next couple of years, in the next couple of years like tattoo, tattoo removal businesses would probably be a space where there's, you know, a reasonable business market. Um <laughs> Perhaps some sort of strategy around that um, potentially, <laughs> but what? So almost six years in, as you said, the, what have been the biggest learnings for you on on that journey? Well, just thinking about uh, what you what you were saying, where, like you said, you know, your business, my business, um, the challenges that all of us would sort of face with our own businesses is the same. I think it's probably a, a recent learning, but really trying to dial in around what you're good at, so that moving forward you can spend time there and try to focus in that area. And then, you know, building a good team of people with supplementary skill sets and, and be it internally or maybe externally with coaches or um, accountant, you know, sort of the business support team around you is, is really key. Um, probably not something that I did early on. And, yeah, I guess maybe growing now as, as a business owner, it, it's an area that I'm sort of really focusing on and even internally in the business um, recently completed some sort of like personality um, tests and profiles uh, through Wealth Dynamics um, to sort of see where everyone's strength lies and moving forward, trying to expand the business um, and the way that we do things so that everyone can sort of work a bit more on, on their strengths um, and in the places that, yeah, their skills lie. Nice. What's your Wealth Dynamics profile? I'm a star. Um, star? 
Yeah. So I think I think Oprah Winfrey is the one that I remember who <laughs> similar sort of personality traits to me. Uh, yeah. And then um, fortunately, uh, Aaron, who uh, sort of yeah, who's other key role in the business, he, he's a lord. So we've sort of got a real um, balance, I guess, between um, sort of two ends of the spectrum. Absolutely. We we uh, hire. I think uh, in our Philippines team. I think maybe they're all they're almost all lords. Um, that that's basically our brief to um, to the VA Platinum, the BPO that we work with. With that, that I'm like, we're basically just looking for lords because we need people that are across the all of the detail and stuff. And we rely on that a fair bit when it comes to hiring. I don't think there's any any right or wrong answers there, unless you're a mechanic, which of course is the right answer because that's my profile. But when what I've found with using that profile over time is it's more just it's not like what can you do or what can you not do it's just like where are you in flow and um you know the mechanic profile is about high creative energy and high detail energy so give me a spreadsheet and i can rock that all day and i feel super pumped at the end like i just want to keep working on it whereas well, i've got zero percent in the in the blaze energy which is the people energy which seems really weird as an advisor. And for, you know, for the last decade, I spend most days talking to people, um, you know, whether it's team or whatever, but if I do a, a whole day of back-to-back -back meetings with people, whether it's clients or team, or whatever, I just feel really drained at the end of the day. So it's just sort of the, not like I say, not what you can and can't do, but where are you in flow? And I've found, particularly when we've had people that, um, have exited the business either they've chose to exit or we've chosen to exit them when we look back at their their profiles and their you know the different testing that we do and we do part of their onboarding we those gaps pick up like we it sort of sticks out to go shit this is probably something that we should have seen or should have realized or should have called out and kept a closer focus on you know in, in the early days so i think it's really important i was i was really fortunate that one of the guys in our business coaching group is an organizational psychologist. And when I'd had, I'd hired some people and they didn't, they, they just weren't the right fit for the roles. And I was talking to him going, shit, it's so hard to find the right people for the right roles. And he helped me create these different sort of frameworks for testing where we'd go look at, okay, what's the role? What are the attributes that we need for success in that role? All the competencies. And now we assess them with different, you know, diff in different methods. So we use wealth dynamics as one part of that for where people are in flow. We use uh, SHL testing for like psychometrics to make sure that from an aptitude perspective that they're, you know, good with numbers if they need to be, or they're good at checking stuff if they need to be, or they're good at um, solving problems if they need to be, and then, you know, doing stuff with interviews as well. So I reckon it's really powerful, um, that approach. And the more we lean into that, the better the results I've found that we have when we do actually bring someone into the team. Um, but yeah, it's also just sort of interesting from a how you communicate with people as well and how people you know, like to hear the messages, you know, internally within the team and then also with, with clients as well. What I was going to ask you, what what does a typical week look like for you and how do you structure your, how do you structure your t time yeah, well, um, I one of the areas of, um, I guess, most improvement is that sort of time management piece for me. You know, the, the consistent, like, element is, is is something that I'm just sort of all, always working on. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty big on sort of, like, mapping out the ideal week, usually sort of Friday or Sunday, sort of before it starts. Um, what like to sort of chunk maybe one to two hours each morning, um, which is – working on, I guess, priorities, which might be a bit of business planning or business development, um, strategy prep for clients before I do anything else or before I sort of jump into email, uh, just because generally that sort of, you know, flow time, first thing in the morning, you're the freshest. Um, mm. Ideally, if, if if I've set, you know, the top one, two, three priorities the night before, I'll walk out feeling really good about myself at the end of the day um, where you, know, you can have those days sometimes where you're not that organised and, you jump in and um, I guess, yeah, you know, you start chasing shiny objects, um, get to the end of the day and it doesn't feel as successful as it sort of should be. Yeah. So, yeah, I, the, the, the book, The One Thing, was really um, like a big sort of powerful resource for me in the last sort of 12, 18 months. It's probably the, the number one book that I would now hand out to sort of clients and friends, um, just focusing in on, yeah, using time as, as a resource, 
looking to get a return from it. So, yeah, try try to sort of time block my priorities throughout the week. And um, as I said, normally as a sort of non-negotiable, try and sort of do first hour and a half to two hours each morning um, as, yeah, my sort of, you know, top one to three priorities before looking at email, before sort of jumping in, you know, or booking meetings and sort of get going where the day can, can, can take us. I find, um, yeah, too much white space in the diary on a Sunday or Monday morning leads to sort of, you know, not, not the best week when it gets sort of get to Friday or start looking back at things. Nice. And how do you how do you find balance with, you know, you've got three young kids at home, um, you know, and a partner and stuff. Like how do you find that balance between as a business owner, there's always so much, there's always another thing that you can be doing and you're trying to grow the business and manage the business and look after the clients and, you know, look after your family. How, how do you How do you tackle that? And again, area that's um, constantly under construction. But I would say from, from that, like the one thing um, book, you know, they, and again, come, comes back to sort of the business piece where, you know, make appointments with yourself, get stuff in the diary. Um, so that, that that's really key, be it, um, you know, a gym, which is a little bit of me, you know, me time or doing a, my son now is four and a half. So there's a few like extracurricular uh, activities for football training and stuff like that where I've got to leave work a little bit early and share the load with my partner. So making sure that that's all sort of penciled in at the start of the week, I guess, like you said, it's it's easy to, you know, all, all of us on the on, on this call and yourself, myself, you know, you could go back and, you know, we, we could work all day with all the administration and tasks and things to do that need to be done in financial planning and we've all probably spent time there doing those things, um, you know, red-eyed and, what we you know, work into stupid hours and stuff like that. So I think, you know, a, a, a growth piece from being in the industry for a while is, you know, you, you'll never get it all done. Um, the people pleaser in me um, always wants to sort of you know, respond to emails quickly or say yes to a lot of things. So I guess growing as a business owner is learning to say no a lot more. Um, mm. Like you said, coming back to try to focus a bit more on the things that really matter, um, which again, you know, it's probably, yeah, a growth journey as a as a husband as a father and you know definitely as an advisor you know not not everything we do carries equal weight um mm. and you know, working on trying to focus on the things that do matter and then coming back to that um personality profile setting things up so i can spend a bit more time on the things i'm good at that carry a lot of weight within the business is i guess yeah where, where we're at what we're focusing on and you know sort of continuing to try to work on and it's amazing that you uh, you know stop work and and don't work as long as hours, but still the most important things get done. So it's it's easy. there's always more to be done. But I found for myself, like when when I when we had our first kid, then that was that helped that forced me to switch off a bit. But particularly when we had our second one, that now it's like my five to seven is off limits, and I don't do team stuff. I don't do client stuff I don't do but in fact I don't now I don't after having second kid I just switch off the laptop and I don't switch it back on again in the evenings I make a point of, of doing that and you know stuff still happens nothing catches on fire for the most part and um, you, you know you get there so it's good for that little bit of forced boundaries because I find you particularly as a business owner that it's, there's always something more um, more to to do Ryan what are you working on or what are you focused on in the business at the moment so we're probably at a point where we're looking at and exploring, I guess, where, where we go from here, just as a business um, and, and even just internally with sort of the team structure. So we've got three uh, of us at the moment. We're, we're probably missing uh, one, one, one position, one role, probably like the, the CSO type role at the moment where uh, Aaron, who works for me, he, he works from home, uh, Jazzy, she's over in the Philippines. So I'm sort of the only one in the office at the moment. And, yeah, we had a staff member resign late last year haven't replaced her just yet. So I think go, going to four people in the team just with our skill sets, um, where the business sits and sort of what we need just at the moment is probably like the immediate focus and just working out what that team structure or like little pod structure looks like within now sort of part of the world. And then um, from there, like probably most advisors, we're, we're looking to grow. And then it's just from a model perspective, I guess business model perspective, working if we, um, you know, stick in the shorter term with just me as the advisor, um, Aaron is an advisor, so we're exploring some options around him, maybe starting to sort of move up to the LOA role um, or, you know, do, do we look to sort of, you know, push on and grow and maybe end up with a couple of advisors uh, in the business? Just, yeah, I guess um, 
what, yeah, put, put playing a few scenarios out, you know, running some some modeling and cash flow and, um, you know, doing a bit of stuff that we talk to clients about um, within the business. And so how, yeah, how do, I was going to ask you, how do you tackle that, that decision? Because obviously there's, it's hard and like certainly we are, I've tried a whole bunch of different things, haven't cracked the code, we've done some stuff that's worked, some stuff that hasn't worked as well and there's a lot of different ways to be right. But I suppose it is quite like when it comes to clients, like a lot of different ways that you can build your wealth, there's a lot of different ways you can build a business um, and I don't think there's any one approach that's perfect. Uh, so, yeah, well, what, what is the process that you go through when making those decisions? Well, the, the, the CSO role at the moment, we, we, again, a bit of um, self-awareness, I guess, is probably just a big part. Like we've just explored where the business is at, how the team is set up and what our skill sets are. And I guess, yeah, we've we just sort of come to the conclusion that we're, that we're missing a piece. And for us to grow, you know, there's, there's things that we're all doing now that we sort of need to pass off to someone who will be really good at it. Um, to help facilitate a bit of growth in the, in, in the short term. So, yeah, at, at the moment, we've probably just looked at sort of the gaps in our in our process because, you know, continually reviewing how we do things and trying to become more efficient and do things a bit better. So I guess, yeah, through that process, we've just uncovered quite a few gaps that haven't been filled since the previous staff member uh, resigned late last year. So it's probably, yeah, just no, no real um, financial metrics at this stage are, are around sort of what that person will do for the business, but it's just that, you know, we know that with a bit more capacity, you know, there's more work that we can do. There's more growth that we can achieve with that sort of business model with the four people. Um, and one thing mm. through, and this this may be useful, it, it hit smacked me in the face when um, I did a bit of work with some business coaches and they were talking about different business models um, and what they were sort of talking about as an ideal sort of structure for a smaller style of business was, yeah, one one person in sort of sales uh, and marketing, I guess, which I would sort of put myself in as the advisor and sort of the, the business development person in the business. Um, two, two in delivery, which I would say at the moment for us would be Aaron um, and Jazzy, who's in the Philippines. And then one for sort of ad- administration, uh, and I guess in our industry, maybe like client services or support on that front. So that that's sort of the mini model, I guess, that we're working towards and probably help maybe shape my decision around working on that four-person team just at the moment. Mm. Yeah, I think that those uh, we share the same, you know, coaching support through the through David Dugan and the Abundance Global community, and they talk a lot about the different team structures or or team sizes, particularly that are profitable from a business perspective. And I sort of didn't believe it with the first few times that I heard it, but we've absolutely experienced that that. When we had a four-person team, it was highly profitable because you've got a you got a good balance there, not too much in terms of your costs. Then we grew and went past that twelve-person number, and as we were getting there, it was like profitability went backwards. But then you get to twelve, and things are like sort of humming along again. Um, and then the next what step from there is twenty-four. We're twenty-one people at the moment. Have noticed that in get, and obviously it's a bigger leap to add another whole twelve people that you slow your profitability slows because you like creating support structures or um you know trying to do it the other way around which is difficult where you've got a lot of delivery people but not the right support and you know that then the team get pissed off and that's difficult to manage as well so um yeah i think there's a lot there's a lot in that a lot of different ways obviously you can structure it but um yeah definitely effective uh and rings true with those models and and the size and and how they work um it's just you know figuring out how to get from each stage in one stage to the next, which is a tricky part in my experience. Yeah, and, and and just having a little bit of that framework to work towards. Where before that, you know, re- reach out to other mates that were advisors and or you know friends that in other businesses, you know, and I guess X Y is a great uh, resource to use there. Obviously, with everyone sharing about how they run their business and just yeah, looking at the different models, the different team structures, and trying to pick what what you can out of what. What, what, you know who you can speak to or what you can see to sort of make your business a bit better that's right yeah and you mentioned before you're at your pd day with 90 different advice businesses and they're all doing things a bit differently i think that's the thing about a be- beauty and curse i suppose of advice that everyone's everyone's got their own take on on different things and there's a lot of different ways to be right so unfortunately there's no you know one bouncing ball that everybody can follow to to get there but yeah, so I suppose that the the obstacle is the way in that, like you know, it's sometimes frustrating, as I'm sure you experience from time to time with that journey. But it's all sort of 
the fun of it as well. Uh, I mean, in well, at least for me, I find that figuring that piece out and trying some stuff, some of it doesn't work, some of it does. You know, it's um, it's uh, it's interesting, and especially in this sort of transition period with advice, where we're you know getting more um, interest and in, and sort of results for consumers and getting more um, consumers behind it as well, which is great to see. So. Um, yeah. And and, yes. and then you know and, and the other point and again it came a bit from the the conference the other week with with all that sort of business structure in mind it's you know we're pretty fortunate in the industry where in, you know there's a, there's a lot of things tilted as you said like in our favour um, mm. the, the demographics and the, the media the compliance you know like it, it, that, that's the thing like we're, you know we're fortunate where, where we sit some friends that have di- different business models or different industries um, you know. Mm. different conversations about their sort of prospects and opportunities moving forward. So, yeah, like I said, there's, there's all the challenges, but there's a lot of good stuff as well. Mm, totally. And it's somewhat protected from the change that like COVID disruption and those sorts of things. Obviously, businesses have all been disrupted, but the fact that we can work from wherever and, you know, manage things remotely and people are getting on board with that puts us in a good spot. But Ryan, I could chat this all day, but uh, I know you've got a zoo to get to, so I won't. Uh, my last question for you is: uh, if you could go back to your uh, back to yourself day one, you know, rolling out the shingle in your business and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? I probably would have focused on, um, yeah, like maybe that sort of t- time management piece a, a little bit more, being being really clear about you know, what my strengths were, what my targets were, what my sort of KPIs were and making sure that my diary each week and each day was sort of matched up to that because I think early on I, I got bogged down a lot with the administration and all the behind the mm. scenes that came into the business and so the, the growth path of the business, you know, when I took that shift and made that change has been vastly different to what it was at, at the start. So Absolutely. Yeah, I think making sure your highest priority work and it's easy. We get the pleasure hit from responding to the email or ticking that little thing off the list, but it's like, what is the one thing to that, you know, to that book reference that you mentioned and, um, you know, getting behind it so that you can have the impact and, and move forward. So, uh, yeah, some, definitely some great advice there. Ryan, thanks for sharing your story, mate. Really appreciate it. Uh, looking forward to hearing about the next stage uh, when we catch up next time. You know, thanks for having me, Ben.